Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Ted. I'm really happy to be here. Um, thank you to Lisa, Camila, and Gidskill for the invitation and the hospitality. It's been a real pleasure, so thank you. Um, just by a show of hands, who works or lives in the world of art? Okay, beautiful. And just by a show of hands, who lives or works in the world of HIV AIDS? Okay, well, I dedicate this to you. Thank you. To everybody, but I have special heart for people who are living and working in HIV. Um, so, uh, this is my title. I think this is a good Norwegian word, which means um, HIV stories. I like it. Um, the title, some of you may recognize if you've been to the Munz Museum in the last little bit. The start of it has not already been told. So, um, in areas not experiencing endemic rates of HIV, unless you or someone you are close to are, are living with HIV, AIDS comes to you as a series of assemblages, cultural inheritance that you do not or do make sense of. Historically in the West, both the streets and the gallery have been a site for receiving these cultural inheritance of HIV AIDS, along with, of course, the media, family, the playground, the dance floor, and gossiping. As a white, cis, HIV-negative gay guy who came of age um, after the period often called the crisis years or the plague years, but before the internet was available in my home, AIDS came to me almost through osmosis. It was always a thing I knew about, but I didn't know why. Now, in adulthood, I take as my work to question, refine, share what I think I know about HIV, and to question what we all think we know about HIV. My presentation here today takes very seriously the role art and culture play in shaping what we think we know about HIV. Specifically, I will be looking at the gallery, but also the movie house, the page, and the street. How are AIDS narratives formed? Can they change? Again, how do we know what we know about HIV AIDS? When it comes to cultural inheritance of AIDS, I like to think it starts with love, if not in the moment, than of each other. AIDS of, course, is a series, um, AIDS, of course, is a series of acquired symptoms, a diagnosis given to someone already living with the human immunodeficiency virus, whether or not they knew it or not. HIV is a material reality. Some of us are living with it, some of us are not. Um, HIV, of course, has real-world consequences. The immune system is compromised. Medication can help. But as we know, there's also the social dimension of AIDS, the stigma, the loss, and not to be ruled out, possibility. But what do we do to address those things? In 1989, the Canadian Art Collective, General Idea, worked to make AIDS visible, literally, um, which you can see there. Uh, so, Love is Robert Indiana's famous work from 67, uh, and then here we have General Ideas' work from 1989. Like the Silence Equals Death project needed to make a poster to reach out to others and feel less alone themselves, General Idea turned love into AIDS, giving us the logo we didn't know we needed in a post-capitalist era that the epidemic had come into. AIDS, by General Idea, which appeared in Times Square, on billboards, in subways, um, was inspired by Robert Indiana's love, and it was first a fundraiser work. It was a way to help raise money for people living with HIV, and then it was an artwork. It was the galleries before it was the public's. Grand Fury, the art activist group coming out of New York's ACT UP, was frustrated by general idea, feeling that love as the foundation of AIDS was not enough, that indeed art was not enough, they had their own idea, riot. 27 years later, Norway's own Bjorn Melgaard goes back to love's source through its opposite, and along the way drags up queer theory and art history along the way. Are people familiar with this image here? Yeah, maybe by a raise of hands, I can only see heads. Okay, right, okay, oh, so timid. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm a sensitive guy, so I don't always like what Bjorn says, but I'm drawn to his work. Um, I have a version of this poster above my bed in Brooklyn, and I followed closely Beyond Death, the project that he did uh, for Norway in the Venice Biennale in 2011. Like me, 
uh, I'm saying his name wrong and I'm just embarrassed, so I'm just going to keep saying it wrong and we're all going to get used to it. <laughs> like me, Melgard uses AIDS as a text to understand the world, using it to help him think through notions of sex and gender, but also he uses AIDS to think about race, class, geography, and theory. He is not alone in this way. Jordan Wolfsonian uh, created a video called Raspberry Poser in which the HIV virus bounces through New York Soho with Beyonce's beautiful nightmare as a soundtrack. Ian Bradley Perrin and Vincent Chevalier, young men living with HIV, work through their exposure to HIV-related media as mediated flat in the Tumblr Instagram ecosystem in which they were raised. Your nostalgia, they argue, is killing them because the easily scrollable visions of the past is more compelling than their lived reality. They're being ignored. And of course, there's our own artist with us today, Zahat Zanelli, um, whose photo projects often include black lesbians living with HIV, an all too neglected population in the worldwide discussion around HIV. In the US, though, the works I just mentioned are the exception. We are recovering from what I call the second silence. Um, this is a period from 1996 to 2008 in which HIV AIDS was no longer discussed in the public realm as it once had been. So as some of you may know, 1996 is when the introduction of life-saving medications was available, and I'll explain 2008 for a second. But basically, the second silence is a severe decline in the space HIV took up in public. Meanwhile, ongoing was scientific and political breakthroughs, artistic and cultural production, new diagnoses, and the impact of HIV AIDS on our identities and experiences. The takeaway kind of important is AIDS went from a public concern to a private experience. Services for people living with HIV were systematized, grassroots activism went deep underground, becoming practically undetectable for people newly diagnosed. It's during this period that I came of age, for example. Um, leading us out of the second silence is something I suggest can be called the AIDS crisis revisitation, which I think starts around 2008 with the creation and the circulation and the reception of media about HIV AIDS, specifically for people that weren't there, whether due to age or geography. It's a way of explaining history, assuming that it's new to people. Um, so on walls, screens, and in discourse, mass death and community response are remembered through culled and curated video and film footage, photos and ephemera from personal collections, as well as individual and institutional archives. Footage of pre-regentrified urban centers populated primarily by passionate white 20-somethings fighting for their lives conjure up memories and trauma for many who were there, a possible displaced nostalgia for those who are not there, and a desire for many to be able to return to such an engaged moment, but without the loss. The AIDS crisis revisitation is both helpful and fraught, and at this point, it's too narrow to be fully or truly instructional or liberative. So some examples, um, famously a film called Sex Positive, um, the Oscar-nominated film How to Survive a Plague, which somebody pointed out is basically just like a superhero movie in which five white guys save the world. Um, of course, there's the um, ongoing work around David Warnerovich and Robert Maplethorpe, and all of this is wonderful. These are histories that we're in danger of losing, but as you can tell, there's also something too narrow about this. HIV did not and does not only affect white, middle-class, gay men. So, um, some people have described it. I lost my page already. Um, some people have described it, such as Tyrone Power, as um, it seems that the plague years, as they're being remembered and canonized, appear in memory as decidedly white and middle class. This is a problem. It doesn't give space for all the other realities concerned with HIV AIDS. Um, another example, and one that I'll be talking about a little bit more here, of the AIDS crisis revisitation, specifically the first wave, which is um, this kind of concept I'm talking about around the whiteness and the gayness, um, is this exhibition that's touring in the U.S. right now called AIDS Crisis Revisitation. It was curated by Jonathan Katz and Rakushka, and it understands itself to be a groundbreaking exhibition underscoring the deep and unforgettable presence of HIV in American art. It introduces and, introduces and explores the whole spectrum of artistic responses to AIDS, from the politically outspoken to the quietly mournful surveying works from the early 80s to the present. So, 
in theory, this is wonderful and this is very important. Um, Katz has done a powerful job with this show. Um, he's trying to show that HIV AIDS had a deep, deep impact on the American art world, not just through the loss, but also that artists such as Felix Gonzalez Torres were able to use their minimalism, their love of beauty, and their material to bring HIV and to bring death and to bring sexuality into an otherwise uninterested gallery world. For those of you who can't quite see, this is a mound of candies. It is the exact weight, it must always be the exact weight, of his lover Ross, who died of HIV AIDS. So it's, what happens is you go into a gallery, you take a candy, and then the candies are filled up. I think this is an interesting metaphor to think about through our discussion today. Here's something in a white box, then it's taken onto the street, and then the white box refills it. And Jonathan Katz is powerfully suggesting that this was a trick, a beautiful, powerful activist trick by Torres to bring HIV into the museum. Sadly, though, there is a limit to the work that Katz's show is doing. Um, just before it closed in Tacoma, the first stop in its um, national tour, a young group of activists called the Tacoma Action Committee staged a die-in at Art Aids America. They were all young people, they were all young people of color, and what they were protesting was the lack of black people in the show. The show had over 160 artists, less than 5% of them were black. This is a problem no matter what, but this is even a bigger problem when the show's focus is on HIV AIDS, and even the CDC in America understands that in the United States, African Americans and black Americans um, have the burden of HIV AIDS. Um, so they staged a die-in, they wore t-shirts that said, stop erasing black people, they chanted that, and they were escorted out. They made demands. They wanted um, more black people added to the show as the show went across the country. They wanted more black people and people of color hired at the museum, and they wanted the staff to undergo diversity training because uh, they'd had some incidences of racism at the museum. All three demands were met. This was a success. But this didn't mean that the protest was over. Key Labeja, the only black woman in the show, um, created this image and wrote a text. I think, again, this is a very fitting title for our journey here today. It says, your white walls can kiss my black ass. So what, what do white walls mean when they're not welcoming, when they're not hospitable? Um, her beautiful, her text goes, uh, says in part, Art AIDS America was a decade in the making, Keila Beja says. That is a third of the AIDS crisis, and still the efforts of black and brown women are sitting at the back of the bus, waiting for a chance to sit at the front of an epidemic they never asked to be a part of. Kia goes on to say, My skin is the color of the soil, with roots so deep that no colonialist could ever remove me from this earth, no plague could ever make me crumble from the inside out, and no white man could ever cut me down and use my limbs to burn fire for his rioters who my people are called savages. Kia ends, do not apologize to me. You apologize to them, to all the black and brown women who have died in vain, in lie, in unmarked graves. Um, the exhibition and the protest were an important part of this thing that I'm calling the AIDS crisis revisitation. It became a moment of reconciliation, a target with which to direct the anger at the narrow ways that the story of AIDS was being told. So if a film like How to Survive a Plague was problematic because it just had five white protagonists, then an then exhibition with 160 artists with less than 5% of them being black is also part of the problem. Um, so if Ian and Vincent were saying that nostalgia was killing them, then the Tacoma Art Committee and Kia were saying so too was white supremacy. What made the protests even more clear um, for me was that the AIDS crisis revisitation was not just one movement. While I was researching the exhibition and what was going on, um, I came across many I came across what I'm calling the second wave of the revisitation that did not center whiteness. Works by artists like Tiona McLeod and uh, Reese Ernst were raising up the contribution of poet Essex Hempel and trans trailblazer Louis Sullivan. Um, this, so this was a positive outcome of the AIDS crisis revisitation in general, is that it was illustrating that there's an audience interested in AIDS history. The frustration over the first wave's whiteness then further illustrated that there was a hunger 
within the revisitation for stories untold for communities further marginalized. This emerging work is vital and ongoing, but it does not fully erase the whitewashing that is still central to AIDS narratives that get circulated in the US and exemplified by Art AIDS America. As I watched the story of Art AIDS America unfold from various positions, I had to think about my own place. I wrote about the protest and put them in context, but before that, I worked the last few years at an organization called Visual AIDS. In many ways, the organization is the intersection of everything we're speaking about here today, as it both works with galleries, museums, but also community spaces, universities, and the street to remind the world that AIDS is not over. Visual AIDS preserves the legacy of artists lost to the epidemic, it supports artists now living with HIV AIDS, and encourages artists across the HIV spectrum to participate in making work and having conversations about the epidemic. I started working there just as the revisitation was in full stream. Um, it was there that the osmosis of how I knew about HIV came up against the work I was doing and the work I wanted to see. While visual aids was not a part of the whitewashing of the AIDS crisis per se, we were proximity. We had allies, partners, and friends that were doing the whitewashing. Also, through visual aids, I was a catalog contributor to Art AIDS America. Um, and visual aids had artist members that were in the Art AIDS America show. Interestingly, though, the more I did this work, the more I needed to get out. I was interested in doing the work, I was interested in, um, in leaving the dominion of the art world so that I could see HIV AIDS from a different perspective. Um, I knew that as long as I stayed in the art world, I was going to continually be centering white people and predominantly gay white men as it came across in HIV AIDS. Um, what always frustrated me while I was doing this work is that the story of AIDS always is supposedly beginning in 1981 with uh, the CDC report and then the New York Times report, but this didn't make sense to me. How could a plague just start in the middle of a city just with white gay men. So I started to go back and do research about uh, the names that I'd come across that no one had done anything about. And often what you would see um, is that one thread led to another thread. So before I knew what I was doing, I started a Twitter feed, a hashtag called Our Herstory, and I just put up um, interesting things about HIV AIDS that people were never talking about. So whether it was the Japanese American uh, man who started uh, Critical Path, which was a newsletter containing early and comprehensive HIV treatment, or if it was about little Elvis, who already in 1988 was pleading for people to understand that the crisis was not over. Then I came across this name, Robert Rayford. Um, he died in 1969 of what was confirmed in 1987 to be of HIV. To me, this was fascinating. How come we never told this story? Why don't we talk about Robert Rayford and HIV AIDS? Well, I, maybe, maybe as Europeans, you all know better than I why North Americans didn't talk about Robert Rayford. Um, so, um, as I think was kind of mentioned in my intro, uh, I quit visual aids to go to a seminary. Now, I don't know if people know what a seminary is, but I sure didn't six years ago. But basically, it's where you can learn theology. I went there because one of my mentors went there, and it was a place where you could learn about race and religion in the United States, which I see as having a huge impact on HIV AIDS. Um, while I was there, um, I had the chance to go to St. Louis for the summer, where Robert Rayford lived and died, and I began searching for more information about him. Sadly, there's not much available about him. He was 16 when he died. I'm not sure if he went to school. He was raised by a single mother. She died in 2011. His brother, who was a little bit older, died in 2007. No one took the time to ask them any questions in the years they were alive, and very little public records remain about Robert. What I did find in my research, and you should know that my research is ongoing, it's not all lost, what I did find in my research is a key to the puzzle. The same week that Robert Rayford, that the news of Robert Rayford's death was confirmed to be HIV-related, um, a book called And the Band Played On, which is this canonical famous book about HIV AIDS, was also released. And one of the most kind of pivotal plot points of that book, which was nonfiction, is um, the, this character called Patient Zero, who supposedly brought HIV AIDS to America. This was a myth from the beginning. Patient Zero is based on a French-Canadian flight attendant named Gaetan Dugas. 
It's also based on CDC information and the author's own imagination. It's been debunked both by scientists, by cultural scientists, and the editor of the book himself has come out and said that patient zero is not this thing that we should be relying on. But the same week that news of Robert Rayford came out, news of patient zero came out. And so America was left with a choice. Did it want to deal with the story of a young black youth in the middle of America for whom there no photos survive and his life and death only raise questions? Or did they want to attach themselves to an AIDS villain, which was already kind of brewing? By then, we had Rock Hudson, who is AIDS' leading man. We had Ryan White, who is AIDS' innocent. Now we needed an AIDS villain. And this is who Patient Zero became. Um, uh, yeah, while I was at this seminary, so I guess to go back to this for a minute, what does this have to do with what I'm here talking about, which is gallery space, which is the gallery versus the public? Well, this is where seminary comes in handy, actually. Ah, um, Tracy West, who's a seminarian, suggests that ethics form where the story begins and our actions reveal our ethics. So what I found interesting was that eight miles from where uh, Robert Rayford lived and died was where Mike Brown, the young man who was shot by the Ferguson police, eight miles from where he lived. And then 100 miles from there is where Robert uh, Michael Johnson lives, a young man who's uh, spending 30 years in prison on HIV criminalization charges. Here you have a holy trinity of three young black men who have been forsaken by the state, either through death, history forgetting, or imprisonment. It's revealing our ethics. Additionally, so if, we, if Robert's story, if Robert Rayford's story shows us how um, black people are being neglected in the epidemic, and then we see that again 20, 30 years later in our art spaces, what we also see reoccurring is that when we choose patient zero as kind of the origin story of AIDS in the US, what we choose is people living with HIV as death causers, as outsiders, as villains, and as criminals. Um, this is where we're going to break into Norway, and then I'm going to wrap up, because I am already over time. Um, according to the latest info, there are 5,622 people in all of Norway living with HIV, with 249 cases reported in 2014. This is a low number, and in fact, it includes people living with HIV who were previously diagnosed and then moved here after. So the total number of new cases is actually less than that. And yet, since um, 1992, as many, 20, as many as 20 people have been convicted under Section 155 of the Norwegian Criminal Code, which applies to a set of communicable diseases, but appears to only have been applied to people living with HIV. It's in one ridiculous, specifically ridiculous, HIV criminalization case in Norway, a man living with HIV was convicted of attempting to infect a man already living with HIV. Why is there a law being used to criminalize people living with HIV in Norway, a country with a low new infection rate and a well-controlled epidemic? And why, in 2012, did the Norwegian Law Commission release a report supposedly done with community that essentially recommended Norway continue to criminalize all unprotected sex by people living with HIV, regardless of the actual risk of HIV exposure? The lone voice of dissent on the committee was an activist, Kim Fanagan, living with HIV himself. Um, uh, I, I hope people know who this is, I won't get into him right now. Um, also happening in Norway in 2012 was um, the Oslo Declaration on HIV Criminalization, which suggests the abolishment of HIV criminalization around the world. Um, this is important uh, because people around the world are being criminalized for HIV. Um, there was a beautiful linkage between that slide and this slide, but all you need to know here is that the earliest HIV samples we have are from Zaire 1959 and the, Dominican, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo in 1960, which some of you may know was the same country, but it, it got independence that year. We often, as the AIDS crisis revisitation tries to suggest to us that AIDS is the story of homosexuality and maybe homophobia, but if we look at the long moment of HIV AIDS history, starting here, maybe we can see that AIDS has much to do with homosexuality and homophobia as it does with post-colonialism, as it does with new technologies, as it does with um, Africa gaining independence, as it does with modernization. And this is where Norway breaks into history. 
Um, part of the reason I was excited to come to Norway is that um, the earliest cases of confirmed HIV-related death outside of North America are here in Norway, um, 95 miles from here. Um, the road family is buried. Uh, in 1976, Bente, uh, who is 10 years old, and her father Arne, who is 29 years old, died of what was later confirmed to be HIV. We never talk about, I don't know if you guys talk about them, I've been doing random asks and people don't seem to know who they are. Just by a raise of hands, who have heard, who's heard of this family? Yeah, he was a sailor, the Nor and actually he wasn't a sailor at the time of his death, he was a truck driver, but, um, <laughs> but that, that's not as sexy a truck driver. Well, it is to me, but whatever. Um, so we went to go I went to go visit his, uh, their grave, the dot. In this literature, it's always the Norwegian sailor was the first confirmed death, but no one really speaks of his daughter. And so this points to the, biggest pro the bigger problem that women are continually being erased from the story of HIV AIDS history. So not only is this family doesn't show up, but then when they do show up, the daughter is excluded. And you should also know that five grave sites down from here is the mother's grave, and she is even further lost. So um, I prepared too much and I'm getting ahead of myself, but I hope you're getting something from my talk. Um, what I guess I'm interested in are the AIDS histories untold, and when they are told, what does it mean? What does it mean in America when we start AIDS histories in St. Louis in 1969. How does that help us understand the Black Lives Matter movement? How does that help us understand that AIDS is still the leading cause of death among some black populations? Similarly, what does it mean if we think about Europe and AIDS and 1967? How does it help us understand any issues that... I, I don't live in Europe, so I'm going to leave that to you to decide what kind of questions could emerge from there. I would like to close uh, to leave you with some thoughts. When it comes to the history of AIDS, here is Norway hiding in plain sight. If you ask most people around the world what they think of when they think about Norway, I'm sure AIDS is not even among the top 10 things. Similarly, when you say AIDS, I'm sure no one's gonna say Norway. Um, and yet, if we look at the history of HIV AIDS in the world, Norway shows up at crucial intersections. Prehistory, as I just discussed, the rights and freedoms of people uh, living with HIV, as we see in the fight against HIV criminalization, and importantly, in the representation in the post crisis era through the work of artists like Bjarn Melgaard. Um, to me, it seems that Norway has been able to have this special role because it's able to weave the story of HIV AIDS into the story of the country better than other places. Ah, nope. Um, if I think about it, when I look at this image, do people know what it's from? It's from the, I think it was the first in the series at the museum where uh, uh, Munch is placed with a contemporary artist. Um, and so I think about all this when I look at this image uh, from the end of it all has already happened. Um, I think about a collective trauma healing method I came across while at seminary. It goes something like, the people who experience the trauma tell their story Others listen, together the storytellers and those who listen make something new together. The newness is the start of trauma being um, healed collectively. Um, with this image, you see two artists expressing themselves, telling their story. Uh, Munch is expressing the tensions that he lived with, and so too is Melgard. Um, the painting, which maybe you can't read, says, Before we went to Ibiza, we tried to infect as many people as possible. This is a shocking statement. It's also super important. He's not only commenting on HIV in general with his statement and the way it connects to some perceived gay lifestyles, he's also picking up on the tension and fears associated with HIV criminalization. Melgard has taken it on as a tension he lives with. He's sharing it with Munch, and then he's sharing it with us. What we do with it is our option. As the audience, are we listening? Are we starting to heal from the trauma either Melgard or Munch are expressing? I don't know. It depends on what we think, do we think that there's trauma being expressed? And it depends on if we think putting the artists together with the audience is something new and something new is being created. As I understand it, while many people like the show, the moxie and the innovation of it, on the other hand, there were audience members and critics who didn't like it. Um, they were turned cold by uh, Milgard's work and they were not sure it deserved to be in the vaulted company of Munch. A question of taste and what counts as art was brought up. These questions are fine, they're good. 
As we saw with Art Aids America, criticism of art exhibitions becomes the intersection where the white cube and the public meet, and it's there that we have the capacity to hear the urgencies the public wants us to hear, be it about HIV or art, or be it about black lives or HIV criminalization. Thank you. <laughs>